Okay, so hello everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this week's SEDS Online webinar. We're really happy to have you. My name is Chelsea Peterson. Um, and before we get started with today's um, presentation, we would like to thank our sponsorship from the IAS, which allows us to offer all of the resources um, that you see um, before you and as well as on our website free of charge. And there's tons of stuff on the website, so go check it out. There's lectures, various learning tools, virtual field trips, and um, lots of new stuff. So today we now have over 1,700 registered SEDS Online members. So thank you for being a part of this community. We are happy to have you all. And today's lecture is by Dr. John Reimer, who's an adjunct professor at both BU Amsterdam as well as King Fahd University. He received his bachelor's and master's from the University of Amsterdam before moving on to BU Amsterdam for his PhD, where he focused his research on research and on uh, recent and Triassic calciturbidites. He has since then had positions at GMR in Kiel, as well as University of Provence, where his research has um, focused on various um, carbonate sedimentology um, focuses and including, yeah, cool water carbonates, calciturbidites, platform systems, you name it, he's researched it. So he then headed back to Amsterdam for a professorship before moving to King Fahd University in 2016. Um, throughout his time as a professor, he's had over 50 master's students and 15 PhD students. And right now he's starting to enjoy early retirement and of course keeping his foot in the door of um, carbonate research. And today we're really excited to have him give a presentation on sedimentation patterns of marine carbonate factories. And with that, John, I will give you the mic and um, look forward to this presentation. All right, thank you, Chelsea, for the uh, introduction. Yeah, I moved around the world a bit to see some carbonates. And uh, I think the first slides already shows it. One of my favorite uh, areas to go to, that's uh, the Dolomites. If you ever have the chance to uh, do some holidays, they have some good food, some good wine there, but also some excellent geology. And I will come back to that later on. I would like to talk today about marine carbonate factories, right? The sedimentation patterns and sequence Why do I stress marine carbonate so much? It's because there's, they vary that much, oh, now I have to find it. the arrow, yeah. Because they vary that much, right? When we analyze carbonates, you analyze sedimentation patterns, you have to look at different environments because these are biota, they respond to different environments. And therefore you get variations in the carbonate factories. When you go for the tropics or the cool water, things change and that's why the biota changes, that's why the carbonate factory changes. But also when you step back in time, things change, right? When we go back to the Cretaceous, you have rudis, things we don't have nowadays. So different biota, they produce different grains and they produce different morphologies and slopes. And therefore you can expect that their sequence stratigraphic behavior will be different. I will show you that this is true, but still in the literature, all the way down from the eighties of the last century until very recently, people keep pushing that carbonates are equal to plastics. And that's one thing to say it very bluntly, I hate when people do that. Carbonates are different. And when you look at sequence stratigraphy, look at number two here, sequence stratigraphy of carbonates, we actually define five types of, of factories. These five types of factories, they all represent different realms where things can, carbonate can be produced. And of course, these are very broad factories. There are a lot of variation can be in there but you have to define carbonate in a certain way to understand the system. Like, like when I look at cars, right? When I look at a car from Germany, from France, Italy, they're all cars, but they all will be a little bit different. They all will respond different when things go on a racetrack or when you're going to the field. Or when you take a Japanese car or a Chinese car, they all have the same principle, but they are all a little bit different. It's the same for carbonates. I already summarized here what, what the difference are. When you look at the tropical factories, they produce a lot of stuff when sea level is high and, and, and the corals can grow into the, uh, because of the light, they can grow very fast. But when you lower sea level, you shut it down so that you get kind of separated sequences and variations in sediment export. When they go to microbes, they, they produce all the time because they sit in the upper slope and they produce sediments all the time. I, I will show you that later on in, in, the, in the lecture. The cool water factory, as the word already says, they're loose grains. They're more a classic behavior. I will also show you some, some stuff from the field. 
and therefore they behave differently. They, they may infill valleys, they make shelf margin fans. And then two more factories, the cool water corals, they're very massive when you move down into uh, deep basins of the Atlantic Ocean, they're, they're all over the world. And they, they depend on currents, water masses, food supply, they need to get food somewhere. So they show differences in their growth based on how much food is available. And something we never should forget is the pelagic factory. All the stuff that floats in the open ocean, like coccolis or forams or pteropods, they can produce a lot of sediments. Just walk to uh, the channels that separates uh, the UK from, uh, from the continent. Here we see a lot of uh, pelagic uh, stuff being deposited, the Cretaceous coccolis, the white cliffs of Dover and so on. And therefore, when I already mentioned all these five factories, you see that each carbonate factory, it really needs an individual sequence stratigraphic approach. You can't just state that carbonates are the same. Before I forget, when you work on and you do projects, you always work together with other people and that you pick up certain ideas, you discuss certain things, and at the end, you you're the one that presents it, but you learn from all these people. At the present, we are we're working on a fourth edition of the, of the Reading book, together with François Buchen and Emmanuel, Emmanuel Fenin, and we, we discuss a lot of stuff. And therefore, some of the, the things I, I showed today may be based on, on these discussions. Also, we had a nice session at the EIS in Prague, and a lot of people discussed uh, during the, the session, but also afterwards, people gave some very good remarks. And I always uh, look uh, forward to when I read papers of uh, people that do stratigraphic forward modeling. I think that's the way to go. So John Bogomano, Peter Burgess, thanks. Also Dolomites, one of my favorite areas. Uh, Piero Gianola, he, he's, he, I discussed a lot of stuff with him. He submitted, gave me some, some nice pictures to use. Mirio Preto is a good guy. And Loris Geim, he, he died in, a, in an accident uh, a few years ago. He also helped me a lot. And of course, when I published a paper on carbonate factories, you always have people that have to read the stuff you, uh, you publish. And there's always a lot of work. So I thank Tracy Frank, Luis Pomar, Brian Pratt. And we look at these two pictures on the side here. These are actually carbonates, but they're used in a little bit different way. You see that carbonates can be building blocks. This is an old fortress and on Sri Lanka that's totally made up of carbonates or another wall. You see that's some silly stuff called silica classics in between, but all these boulders are carbonates. So carbonates build up real sturdy walls. That's a small joke on the side. Okay. When I compare silica classics and carbonates, it's all about the source and the sink. When I look at the classics, people use the source to sink approach. Where you go to a mountain range, rivers generate it and transport all the sediments into the open ocean realm where it can be deposited. But in carbonates, you produce stuff like here in the upper right hand side, the tea factory. You produce things and at the same time you deposit it. So carbonates have a source and sink approach. And so it's the classics, when you go for the second one, it depends on the size in the hinterland, climate variations, how much erosion actually takes place. And these things kind of steer your variation in sediment supply. When you go to carbonates, it's, it's climate, it's environment, it's how the biota and all the stuff is feeling well, what geological time am I dealing with? So a slightly diff difference again. And also when I look at silica classics, when I look at variations in sedimentation patterns from the source to the sink, these patterns are more or less the same because the principle of, of erosion and transport through rivers is more or less the same through time. But when I go to carbonates, I have large variations because when I go back to the Precambrian or to the Cretaceous or nowadays, the carbonates vary and therefore sedimentation patterns vary. So that's why comparing classics and carbonates, you enter two different worlds. That's why sequence static feet will be different for both systems. When I look at the present day ocean, silica classics, you see that here is a very nice graph from a very nice book from uh, Milliman and Farnsworth, in which they analyzed all the different aspects of, of discharge and sediment delivery to the, to the global ocean. Here you see the, the mean annual discharge. These are the numbers here, and the arrows are proportional to these numbers. 
look at it, how, how much variance there already is in the present day ocean. It all depends on where the system gets its sediments from. So you have your source on the right hand side. There always will be a filter between your source and your sink in which you have storage in between or in your coastal area. So source to sink is a very thing you need to attend to when you look at plastics, but it always will be a source to sink. Also, the, uh, when you look at the annual discharge of fluvial sediments, you see that it varies throughout the world or the, the, the number on the right hand side, the number of dissolved solids. So depending on the hinterland, the denudation area, these arrows, for instance, they vary in the amount of material that can be delivered as al along the, the bottom of the rivers or within the water itself. Also depends, of course, on the discharge. You can see here in Southeast Asia, the discharge is very high because you're in the middle of the tropics and there is a lot of erosion takes place. That's why you get, we are able to deliver a lot of sediments into your basins that surround the continent. When we then go to carbonates, I talk about carbonate factories. When we go back in time, this is the term that was coined in the early 50s by the Shell Laboratory in uh, Miami, like Bob Ginsburg and co-workers started using that term. In the 80s, we had a kind of first sales of classic sequence ticker V, carbon sequence ticker V approach. When you go to the 88 volume of uh, SEPM 42, there's a nice chapter by Rick Sark on, on carbonates, but most of the stuff was actually, the, most of the, when you analyze this book, you see that most of the chapters, all the other chapters are actually on plastics. Actually, that also will be the same in the writing book. When you look at the old writing book, most of the chapters are on plastics. And poor us, we only get one chapter for the carbonates, for all the carbonates. We actually need an entire book, but okay. That's one thing uh, we can do in the future. The real carbonate factory used started with uh, Morris Tucker and, and Wright, Paul Wright in the 1981 in their chapter two or Walker and James in chapter 14, they start using this term. The, the real breakthrough actually came in the, in the early 2000s, early 90s, when two carbonate factory terminology schools developed. There's one school by uh, Wolfgang Schlager. He based his carbonate factory divisions on what type of organisms do I have? What's the temperature and nutrients? They, they vary according to that. How much sediments can they produce, but where will they produce the sediment? How will they participate, pre precipitate their, their carbonate? I will, I will show you later on. What type of mineralogy, what type of slopes and platform morphology, it's all different kinds of systems that, that he tried to incorporate in, into his carbonate factory concept. Another concept was developed by uh, Luis Pomar at this, more or less the same time. He had a more genetic approach with, uh, in which he aimed at hydraulics, the type of sediment, the production site, and, and the license sensitivity. So you see there are slight differences between the Schlager and Pomar school. Because I did my PhD with Wolfgang Schlager, you uh, more or less can guess with what type of terminology I will use throughout this uh, lecture. An alternative approach was uh, used by uh, Noel James when he, st he really started working on cool water carbonates after Nelson from New Zealand had started working on that one in the 80s of the last century. And he divided the world in the photozone with warm water, euphotic and oligotrophic waters or heterozone. So you see there are a lot of different classification schemes and it might be puzzling for people to work with. So for the, for the new book in the Reading, the fourth edition, the one single chapter on carbonates, we're pushing this, this overview. You see that in the seventies, Lise and Buller already made a distinction between tropical, subtropical, chlorozoan or, or foramols, forams in the, in the more temperate waters. And you see that more and more people try to push carbonates into a certain system. And as you can imagine, we started with two terminologies and then you ended up with five, six, seven or eight, even more. And then the photozoan, heterozoan division came in. But later on then Schlager pushed his tea factory, his sea factory, so his tropical factory, his cool water factory and his microbial factory. In the new book and in, in the Reimer 2021 paper, we try to uh, divide a little bit more, right? We, we, we go for the tropic requirements. I will show you that later on and, the, and what type of pre precipitation actually takes place. So we try to divide carbon factory depending on where they sit in the present day oceans, 
and how we can use that when we go back into time, how they depend on food, temperature, and these type of things. So once again, we five is more or less, I think the, the maximum uh, number you should use, you always can make subdivisions, right? You can split up in endless type of variations and T factory can have a little bit of C factory in there and otherwise, but try to look at what is the main thing I'm looking at? What is the main production of sediment that takes place? And then the tropics, what is the, the main sediment actually that goes out? James, I show you again, the heterozoan association, cool water, and the photozoan association, more the warm water. You see all these different terminologies that were used before, and he tried to summarize that in two different type, big groups, right? But I think I always get confused to when I see a lot of terminology being being used with when you use abbreviations of biota that are in there and bryo, bryonoderm to me more sounds like a, a very bad disease than the type of facies. These are the, the things that uh, Noel James worked on a lot, uh, the heterozone association. But I think heterozone, photozone is a terminology that people use a lot nowadays. One thing I, I didn't like about that uh, that division is that you also had OOIDs in there, which to me are not photosome. Although the insights nowadays change a bit as more and more people think that and show that the microbes have play a role in, in producing OOIDs. Then we go to the uh, Pomar approach. He developed a, a very colorful scheme with uh, types of zonation, euphotic zone, uh, oligophotic zone, different types of, of, of lines that, that were present in the ocean, how much light actually could penetrate in the water mass, where, where to, to a certain line where rotolith only can survive. And he, he tried to yeah, organize that in such a way that you could, could look where, where the biota actually uh, was positioned, what type of behavior you can expect. When you look here at the, at the upper uh, slide, the amount of production, how much grain size will actually, what type of grains were produced and where the grains were deposited. And he tried to develop that for different types of, like you see here for a rim shell, for an open platform, for a, the Disley Steepen platform or for a homoclinal carbonate ramp. So he tried to look more at the, at the morphology and different types of, of a more genetic type of approach because he, he used depth dependent carbonate production. He used it. He looked at hydraulic energy levels and he tried to organize, tried to understand what grain sizes and bulk density of the skeletal components were produced. And as, of course, he, he wanted to understand how they related to the offshore transport capacity. He then introduced the term ge geogenetic accommodation space, which as you see here, includes a lot of terminology, a lot of different things that need to be addressed before you can give it a name. Company factory uh, approach of Wolfgang Schlager tried to avoid that. He actually looked at marine precipitation and looked if it was biotic or abiotic, and if the biota played a role in really in carbonates being deposited, or or uh, it were an intermediate, or they really played a role, really steered how, how carbonate was was formed. And of course, he looked at do these uh, carbonate do they need food? Maybe to capture it out of the water column, or do, do they use diffusion? Then he came up with the, the microbes, the mud mound factory, the cool water factory, and the tropical factory. So he really looked at the precipitation modes, the feeding strategies, strategies and the associated carbonate factories. So it's a slightly different approach. It overlaps with the uh, approach of POMAR, but more looks at precipitation modes and feeding strategies strategies and the temperatures of the waters. He also developed kind of depositional geometries that could emerge from the strategy of, uh, of the type of carbonates that were being formed. When you look here at the production rates and production depths, you see that tropics are really restricted in the upper part of the water column because light is their main thing that they need to produce their carbonates. When you move to the right to the cool water, you see that production rates are less but they tend to have a broader range, a broader uh, water depth range. They go into the final category of, of Schlager, the mud mount. You see, it doesn't show up in the upper part of the water column because they couldn't re resist the waves, but they have a very high production rate 
to very large depths. Even around methane seeps, you will find microbes that can produce carbonates. So morphology, feeding strategy, production rates, and production depth were the main pillars on which Schlager used, uh, based his uh, classification scheme. So the light dependent thing, production rates of the, of the factory independent of light, but a, a, water, a wider depth range, and of course the M factory. So every factory, they all produce carbonate, but in a different way. One thing that Schlager did not address in his uh, 2003 and 2005, and even the year 2000 uh, subdivision were the planktic foraminifera. And to me, one thing we at that time were not, was not that well developed, but over time, more and more people started researching cold water corals and what a vast amount of carbonate is being formed in the deeper waters. That's why I decided to do a kind of review and update of the carbonate of the Schlager uh, system and add cold water corals that in his system were part of the cool water. I, I thought they were important enough to have their own factory. They produce different types of cars. So the same principle like Schlager said, biotic, biotic controlled and induced. And then you look at how the feeding strategy is. Of course, within the planktogram on all the way on top, you can have nutrient steered or light steered to so have different types of biota that develop. The same holds for the cool water, light or nutrients, and even when you go to polar regions, you can get a kind of subdivision of your cool water. So I stick to the main colors, all these little variations, they produce little variations within the system. It's like the type of car or the type of cheese you, uh, you buy, right? French cheese has a, has a lot of varieties and, and everybody knows that it's French cheese, it can have a different taste. It's the same with carbonates. It, they all produce carbonates, but they have a different taste. The microbes, the tropics, the cool water corals, the cool water and the planktic ones, they all are different. Why are they different? Because they're situated at different latitudes. They relate to different water temperatures. Light, it's, for some of them, is very important. The other one is not. Nutrients, they have different strategies. And of course, carbon saturation in the water column also plays a role, although other people say it's not that important. But also, in carbonate, you need to look at the environment, right? Where am I? What are my surface currents? Do I have upwelling? Are they situated in deep water? It will be different systems. And how do storms and hurricanes actually affect the entire system? Although the effect of storms and hurricanes, most of the time, when you go to the tropics, carbonates survive these type of events. Things that are very important are the precipitation modes, right? Do, do you do it abiotic? Do you provide a, a kind of matters on which you can deposit your, uh, your carbonates? Or do I really induce it? Do I make it attractive for carbonate to pre precipitate at that specific uh, spot? Or do I have a biota like a coral or a, or, a, or a shell that really controls where the carbonate goes? And of course, when you go into in the marine waters, you want to, and also in, in fresh water, you have different types of, of calcite, right? You recognize your high magnesium calcite and your low magnesium calcite. And depending on the biota, you will have different mineralogies. And like I showed before, sediment production windows, it varies depending on the factory. But also the morphology of the carbonate platform. It depends on the carbonate factory. And then at the end, when you have produced all the sediments, you have to transport it. And then you go to the carbonate slope that very close to the uh, shallow water areas. You need, you're depend on the input and then cementation starts, right? How good is your mineralogy? How stable is it? And can I start cementing my grain straight away? So all these factors, different types of sediment production, different types of sediment export, and they vary for each carbonate factory. When you look at the present day distribution of tropical and, and cool water car factories, you see here the uh, 18 degrees winter isotherm here up north, here in the south. And you see that in between these 18 degrees winter uh, isotherms, all the trop all these red dots, they represent tropical carbonates. One thing that's very special here in orange, not because I'm Dutch, but because it's a very strange environment, the Persian Arabian Gulf, 
It's very saline and therefore it has a slightly different type of, of, of T factory. When you move up north or go south, you will end up in different in the cool water factory, especially the southeastern or the southern part of Australia is very well known for its uh, cool water carbonates. The same for the, for the coast of Ireland or where you, where you move up north to uh, Norway. Once in a while you will find some, especially on Ireland, you will find some very nice white beaches, which are just cool water carbonates. The background of the map, all these variations in gray are the, the, the amount of uh, phytoplankton that's actually available and it more or less shows where you have upwelling and so on. And you see that, that certain, we have a real, for instance here have big upwelling areas. You don't have a lot of carbonates because there are just too many nutrients in the, in the water column. Or here off the coast of Africa, you see that because here there's a lot of upwelling, instead of having tropical carbonates, you will have cool water carbonates. There were some studies from, from out of Bremen who focused on, on that, that system. So up north, down south, cool water in the middle, the tropics, the tube factories. When you then move to the cold water corals, it's only the data set from 2004. If I would update it now, I think there would be much more purple dots here in the ocean representing the cool water factory occurrences in the deep water. They're everywhere. That's why that was my, my reasons for to add them to, to, the, to the factory concept because they're so important. They produce so much carbonate and they're all around the world. But when you then look at the green dots, they represent some very typical occurrences of uh, microbial factories nowadays. Only four I indicated, one of the Bahamas, so when you look at the stromatolites and, and over there, they're very yeah, dominant. When you go to the Gulf of California, you will find some uh, some stromatolites, some very nice stromatolites mixed with tropical carbonates on Tahiti in the slope deposits. And I think the most famous uh, occurrence, of course, is uh, Shark Bay here near Australia. I can add much more, but they don't dominate anymore. When you go back in time, they dominate. Like for instance, when you go back to the Triassic. So when you look at these maps, the tropics and the cool water, the cool water corals, and the M factory, they're all different. They're all situated at different places. Carbonate factories, they precipitate, right? They produce their own grains. It's not source to sink, it's source and sink. They're the source for the sink. When you look at the M factories, they induce, they, they enable carbonate to precipitate. When you look at the T factory, it's partially controlled, partially abiotic and abiotic then at that time, we thought about who it's. When you look at all the other factories, they're really controlled. So that the biota steer the amount of carbonates that are being formed. So when you look at the cold water coral, the C factory and the P factory, they're le nearly model specific set of biologically controlled sediments. All the other ones are mixes. So precipitation really counts. When you look at the mineralogy, here at the top, magnesium calcite, lower left calcite, lower right aragonite. You see that all these factories have their own realm. They're not only precipitated in a different way, they also have different types of mineralogies. Here in purple, I added to the original graph of Schlager, I added the, uh, the cool water corals from studies from, uh, from Lund and from Tichak. And you look here, the, the lower line, there's a P add, added to it. That's where the planktonic factory sits. It has calcite, but also a regolite for theropods or calcite like your forearms. So they only have a very restricted mineralogy range. But all these factories, as you can tell, just look at the colors, they have the different mineralogy that dominates within each system. Then we come to, uh, I, I kind of bashing you uh, with a lot of factories now, different types of morphologies, right? When you look at the marine carbonate factory of the tea factory, it has a very big production realm, the reefs on the side, but also in the entire lagoon, you can produce sediment that can be dumped into, into the deep. Light dependent, so you will have, when you look on the right hand side, you will have variations when sea level goes up, goes down and up. To your high stand, you will flood the entire realm. You have a lot of sediments being produced. When you expose the entire thing, you reduce the number of sediments, the amount of sediments. So light temperature 
high strength shading when the high stand is there to produce low sediment and doing low strength you expose. And I always use when I teach it to students the word spread because they produce so much sediment, they spread it around. So they have a big halo of cement surrounding the production realm. And I go to the cool water factory, the lower graph in purple here, you see that they very located production areas. They produce over very big, large, large ranges. They can go up to two, two and a half thousand meters and still produce carbonates because they depend on nutrients and currents that bring the nutrients. They have variations in high and low stand growth depending on how much food they get. It's the positioning of the water masses. And they produce their own skeleton, they produce their own mounds. That's why I call, use the term frame. This C and M factories, different morphologies, different production profiles, but also different sediment production through time. The C factory has low stands, high stands variations. It depends on nutrients. But these are loose grains. As you see, the topography here is kind of flat. The waves really have an impact on the grains and are moved down. So that's why I use the term move down there to understand how sediments are being produced and distributed. The same, something different now again for the M factory, a flat top. The edge is slightly different. I won't go into that later on. Very high production. And as you can see here, production continues throughout. Because the production realm of sea level goes up and down, it stays there. It is not affected too much by sea level variation. So it keeps on producing sediments. And another thing that's very typical for these factories, the sediments kind of stick. So they stay within the system. That's why they build very sturdy, solid platforms. And of course, your marine, your pea factories, depends on, on food and light within the water column and sediment production kind of varies depending on climate. That's why I call it pulse. With these five terminologies, I think I've shown you that sediment production and sediment export varies for each carbonate factory. When sediments vary, you produce different types of grain spectra. That's why the slopes of carbonate platforms also are different. Here I compare in a, in a graph the carbonates on the right hand side with the clastics that's modified from the study of Adams and Kenter. You see that every factory more or less has its own type of slope. When I go to the C factory, it's Gaussian, right? These type of, of slope. When I go to a T factory, it has a, should, yeah, should I say an exponential with very steep upper slope and then gradually goes down because the grain size kind of goes down. And very steep slopes with straight angles are produced by the M factory. This C, the cool water factory is uh, actually has its own reef building capacity. So it, it builds its own framework and P factory because they're loose grains, they depend on water masses and, and water transport. So all the factories have so many characteristics that you can't say put them in one bucket, right? You have to make a distinction between the different factories because the latitude is different, the environment is different, different precipitation modes, mineralogy, where they produce the sediments, what type of morphology they can make and what type of slopes they can make. So when you have variations in sediment production and sediment export, you have, will have variation in sediment depth percentage during sea level fluctuations or tectonic events. And that's the thing that you look at when you look at sequence stratigraphy. Sequence stratigraphy. That's actually the second part of the talk. I have to hurry up now. When you look, there's a, a very nice book, Principles of Sequence Stratigraphy by uh, Octavian Catignano from 2006, in which he uh, described every single thing that you can imagine about sequence stratigraphy, despite the fact that carbonates in this book also well, play a minor role. In 2020, he, he produced an uh, Another research paper, there are numerous papers in between in which various aspects of sequence stratigraphy are, uh, are, uh, are introduced. And he looked at sequence stratigraphy of deep water systems. And we look at page seven of this paper, he really states that the carbonate settings, sediment delivery to the shelf edge follows different trends. Shelf edge is something we don't have that much in carbonates. With the highest supply during high stands, this times of high stand, when the carbonate factory is usually most productive. High sand shedding. Very nice that you cite the work of uh, a PEC advisor. I'm 
second author on this one, but this is only valid for T factories. So when you move to another system, these things don't apply anymore. So when on page nine, he states that depending on the scale of observation, the growth and the propagation of slope climate forms will take place in steps. And it depends on the, on the availability of sediment to the shelf edge, high sand shedding once again. But then he forgets that it may apply to tea factories, but all the other ones, it, they're not in there anymore. So he only concentrates on one single factory and he uses that principle like he does for plastics. He uses the same thing for, for carbonates that one, one brand will tell everything. That one thing will, will explain everything. It can't be like that. When you go to Bahamas, one of the best research carbonate platform, and you just look at some seismic profiles already from the 80s of the last century. When you look at the upper graph here, how these nice basins are infilled with prograding carbonate platforms. But also look when you lower right-hand side that certain climate forms of prograding carbonates develop on one side, but not on the other side. It's just because the grains are produced there and then pushed to a certain, in a certain direction. When I look at the, the overall carbonate platform shape, and now I'm going to look at the uh, an, an blow up of, of this uh, seismic uh, profile in the next slide, you see that you have a flat topped, a very steep slope, exponential slope, and then horizontal reflectors. But when I go back in time, when you compare the, in the lower graph, the blue ones with the the black ones, you see that the topography changes. That's another thing that carbonates do, they don't have to save morphology all the time. They can change over time. So flat top platform here and carbonate ramp here, there's something that plastics won't do. So not only different factories, but also different morphology. So you will get different sequences in your sequence thread. When I go to uh, cool water carbonates, it is a very nice art crop in the southern eastern part of Spain. Here I have cool water carbonates, and there I can find beach sediments, the coastal lagoon, storm generated fans, marine dunes. These are loose grains, they behave like plastics. So the tropical ones and the cool water ones, they make totally different sequences. When I go to the southeastern part of, of Australia, in the lower slide, you find these blue channels. These are channels that are infilled with cool water carbonates. They behave like plastics, right? So the, the, you don't have carbonate platforms being produced here. They're just loose grains that infill topography, some typical behavior of cool water carbonates. And I think the, the best example actually uh, from the southern part of, fr of France, not only because they have good wine there, but also they have some excellent outcrops in which they show that an, a nice valley, right? You have a flood tidal delta that developed during a sea level fall. This flood tidal delta was infilled with carbonates, real loose grains, cool water carbonates that used the accommodation to and filled it in. It's in the south, southern part of, of France. You see on the right hand side, it's the Uzès Basin. You see different uh, units being formed. They're, they're massive bats, shelly bats, bitabitter bats, hydrolytic bats. But you see that this is really, they behave like loose sands, like plastic sands. Here, once again, this overview, a cross section, and here's the, the planet section map view. You see that they really behave like sands, infilling accommodation space over time. That's a very nice study by Renault, by the way. So, tropical carbonates make morphologies. But depending on the morphology, they can be carbonate ramps or flat top platforms. Sea factories are loose sediments and they infill, they behave like, like loose sands you, you find on, on the normal beach. So something completely different. The third thing I'm, I'm gonna show you is something completely different once again, it's the Dolomites, Italy. We have M factory platforms down there, which are uh, very well developed, very nice studies by uh, the, Italian group or uh, the group from uh, Innsbruck. I show here the, uh, the study by Preto and he, that he published in the APG bulletin. You see different phasey zones with some coral reefs, but some microbials on, on, on the side of the platform, a very big production area on the upper slope. 
and look at these very linear type of, of, of slope deposits. And also note that in the basin, I don't get a lot of sediment. Most of the sediments is in the slopes. When you're done, here are some nice pictures just to show how these platforms actually prograde or this, the cellar platform. And you see some, some interfingering hopping up as shown in this cross section. Very thick platform sediments and very thin basinal sediments. When you now look at how, how these things have developed, these are platforms in the right hand picture. Platform prograded, they're retreated, they prograded again, and then something happened, right? You have some percussion dolomites, these are two types of carbonate platform that developed, and then I go to the highly crotch formation, the holy cross formation. The Holy Cross formation is, is really an expression of a low stand. It's a basin that's infilled by clastics and skeletal carbonates. And then later on, I come to a real transgressor system track and I end up with a high stand system track once again. When I look at this part of the picture, the highly Kreutz and, and its correlation or connection with the Cassian Dolomite, it's, it's in the blown up on the right hand side. I see some Kleiner forms. I see other stuff, some mounds. I see a very yeah, difficult pattern that actually occurs there. This picture actually is shown in, in, the, in the paper by, uh, by Catignano when he looks at the, at the modeling and he interprets here the outcrop. He interprets, and here's, here's the platform on the lower side. He interprets as a high stand system track. And as soon as he sees unlap, he calls it a falling stage system track. Because he states in the paper that first the M factory produces a lot of sediment, then sea level drops, it stops producing, and I get an onlap because plasma exposure and my platform production stops. So the onlap is an expression of platform exposure. But carbonates are different. When you look at the interpretation by the Italian group, it's much more difficult. They really show that the M factory, this nice platform over here, it was kind of hit by a, a climatic event, the Carnian pluvial event. Then production was kind of distorted because after the M factory, there was a drastic decrease in microbial platform derived material. And I got C factory type of sediments in there. That's why I don't maintain these steep slopes anymore. I produce an on lab because I produce different grains. I produce different types of carbonates that can't maintain these steep slopes. And after that, I may have a sea level fall. So the onlap that Catignano showed as being typical of falling stage system tracts is much more difficult in carbonates. It's a carbonate factory thing. It's a, it's a climate change. It's a change in the carbonate factory itself. That's why high sense shedding is not the same all the time. When you expose a platform, it may have another cause. When I affect the carbonate producers, it may also relate to different types of sediments input in the basin itself. Another thing in the modeling chapter of uh, Catignano, and why do I keep referring to Catignano? Because this is one of the yeah, books that, that you have to read when you want to understand stigraphy. And when you see over and over again that carbonates are, are being dealt like something similar to, to plastics, I always get very excited. I really get pissed off, I must say. When I look at, at the numerical modeling, I think numerical modeling is our way forward because we, we can try to understand different systems, but when there are so many factors around that tweaking the carbonate production, the type of factory, the mineralogy, the amount of sediments, you need computer models to really try to mimic your outcrop, to mimic your uh, your your uh, seismic profile in order to understand what type of sedimentation process actually go on. So sediment supply, like he states, Catignano states in his, in his modeling uh, paper, he said there's over overemphasis on sediment supply. I think sediment supply is essential in carbonates, right? If I don't supply carbonate, the system won't survive. Also sediment supply varies and depends on the factory. So Autocyclicity, like he states, is something that we have in carbonates. We had a nice discussion a few months, a month ago on, on this type of thing. 
but also accommodation and control of key aspects of stratigraphic ac architecture, downstepping and upstepping shoreline trajectories. It carbonates, it changes the morphology like I showed for the M factory of the Dolomites. It depends on the factory. It, it's very responsive of the factory to uh, accommodation changes or unfilled accommodation is something normal. And of course, shorelines are less important. So only by highlighting these key words in his statement and compare that to what I see in carbonates, these are two different worlds. Stratigraphic forward modeling here for the Bahamas by study by Busson. It really helps to understand the variation of reflectors that you see at the edge on the platform itself. Which factor or which, which realm produces sediments and what type of sediments and only can computers can grasp these variations and try to combine it. Okay, you, you can produce a lot of rubbish, but you also can produce some very good models that makes you go back to the seismic profile again and rethink your interpretation you made. Source and sink, right? He talks about extra basin on sediment sources. In a carbonate, I am in the basin. I, I produce my sediment. The only thing that comes out as an extra basin on source might distort my carbonate production, where you have a lot of clays or plastics coming in that might distort my, uh, my system. Carbonates are source and sink and not source to sink. And also when I look at paleoclimate, distant and means for sediment transport, when I change my paleo climate, I change my carbonate factory. The transport distance, it depends on my carbonate factory. When I go to a tropical carbonate, when I build a reef, there's no transport. Okay, the foreigners around it can be transport and the muds as well. But also the changes in the means of transport, it depends on where my system actually is situated, in the tropics, in the cool water, whatever. And also he talks about and sediment entry points. When I go to carbonate, the sediment entry points are everywhere, except of course for the cool water carbonate that have a kind of clastic behavior. So there are so many differences when I compare class carbonates with clastics that sequence strat in carbonates can't be high sediment shedding alone. And I think our way forward is stratigraphic forward models because they allow us to put on, put in all these variations to adjust them depending on time, going back and going back into time, what type of other producers we have, because they understand you can tweak the sediment production, you can fluctuate your sea level, even go into tectonic active area to see where, where things are happening. And also you can introduce your timing, right? And at the end, you can analyze the differences of your seedings and sequence stratigraphic stacking patterns based on the variations of your carbonate factories. And associated fluctuations of your sediment production, your transport, and where do I store my sediments? So I think sequence stratigraphic or stratigraphic forward modeling is our way forward to test things, go back to the seismic, go back to the outcrop, and see if we need to tweak our models once again. Like I, I mentioned a few times, factories, they change morphology. That's something that in classic systems, don't happen as much, right? A river and a delta, depending on the type of delta, of course, they, they will vary, but such a drastic change, like from warm water to cool water, you don't see that. Such a drastic change in morphology of the system from one with a, a flat top exponential slope and a basin, or one that more or less behaves like plastic to the cool water, it doesn't change. It doesn't happen in plastics. And also different sediment production and export different link in the production source. So there are so many variations that I, I could go on and on and on. Plastics and carbonates, secrets of that, you can't compare them. You have to adjust your model where you go to carbonates and then look at every single carbonate factory. What type of sequences do I get? What type of secret strat do I need to apply? Another nice, when you ever have the chance to go to the southeastern part of, of Spain, there's a very nice mountain chain, Sierra Malata, and, and it shows everything, right? It shows the flat roof of the sea factory at the base here. It shows a flat top platform and it ends up with microbes. And, and when you do some modeling like uh, Luke Leipold has done based on, on different types of uh, plugs, you can make seismic models out of your outcrop and the different types of reflectors that you will get when you look at, just compare these pictures on the right hand side, when you look at different types of carbonates. 
tectonics in college, always very difficult. When you go uh, to the Red Sea, for instance, the Abu Shar platform, the Miocene in Egypt, just look at these pictures made by uh, Cross and Bosons from 2008. A very complex, it, it's a horse block, very complex sedimentation patterns on top of this block. And he, they developed a, very, a series of models to understand what type of patterns they actually were, were analyzing. And of course, that's very difficult to understand, but recently there was a very nice paper by uh, Machero who just looked at different types of morphologies, tectonic, the steered sedimentation patterns, and it tried to mimic the Abu Shar, for instance, and other platforms. So you really need your modeling exercises to understand these difficult types of carbonate platforms when you are in a tectonic area. I hope I've kind of uh, blown you away and tried to convince you that carbonates are really different and you need to use the carbonate factories to understand what type of sequence stratigraphy you need to stick to. Different environments, different carbonate factories, they vary through time and all these factories have an individual behavior, right? They have a different set of values, different set of parameters that combine in a certain way and produce certain things in a, in a certain way. So just come to the main point, each carbonate factory, it really needs an individual sequence stratigraphic approach and heist and shedding as used by uh, Catignano many, many times, every single time. It's good that he cites it because I get a citation extra, but he should cite much different things because heist and shedding is not the sole answer to all the questions. So what is the take home message? I think using the carbonate factory concept of Schlager, it gives you a lot of variation, but it also, you, you can stick to a certain factory and understand that you, the factory includes the type of sands, the type of mineralogy, where it's produced, when it's exported and where it will go to. So, you kind of assemble a lot of parameters into one single term. That's why I kind of like it. And as I said, they express different production modes because individual factories, they change over time, right? So every factory really holds a set of parameters. And remember that in, in classics, it's source to sink and it's source and sink in carbonates. And that's why when you read sequence stratigraphic papers, always think, Carbonates are different. I have to look at the grains, I have to look at the biota in order to understand the sequences that I develop. And of course, forward stratigraphic modeling can help us to explore that. There are so many parameters. Just look at all the, all the text on this slide. There are so many things that can change. And I think only when you sit behind a computer and you try and evaluate, you can understand what type of sequences can develop. With that, I'm going to stop one more single picture from uh, the Rosengarten Triassic Dolomites and just look at these magnificent mountains, very nice clinoforms, a prograding carbonate platform. Beautiful picture. You walk in in the basin, look up to the carbonates, you sit on a terrace, take a good glass of wine and eat some very good Italian food. With that, I'm uh, going to stop and I hope I've been able to convince you that marine carbonate factories it's the way to go when you analyze sedimentation patterns and sequence stratigraphy. Thank you. Super, thank you so much for that great um, presentation, John. We really appreciate it. Uh, so we already have some questions typed out in the chat. For those of you that aren't familiar, you can ask your questions um, in the chat, but please send them to everybody, not just to SEDS online, so that we can all um, see them and I can read them out. All right, our first question is from Axel Munica in Erlangen. Hi, Axel. Um, he brings up a, a good point, one that I was also going to bring up. Um, so diagenesis, especially early diagenesis, is also very different in the various carbonate factories. Yeah. And how does this, he wants to know how this affects your approach. It, it, it depends on the mineralogy, of course, right? When you go, when you compare tropical and, and cool water factories, the tropical ones, are they, they cement very fast. You only need to expose them for five years and then they cement already. When you go to cool water ones, they behave like, like loose grains. So it depends on the mineralogy of the factory, how digenesis will develop. And we should not forget microbes. Microbes play an important role also on the Bahamas in stabilizing the upper part of the slope. They, they form the, 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 
kind of uh, intermediate on, on which carbonate can be formed. So when you look at a factory, you also, also buy a different set of diagenetic uh, features. Absolutely. Okay, our next question comes from Hildegard um, Westfall from Bremen and Kaust. Uh, thank you for this very nice talk, John. Yes, carbonates are very different from silicic plastics. Yeah. I'm just not entirely sure I like the term tea factory very much for carbonates forming in tropical water and sea factory forming in cool water. Nutrient rich tropical carbonate factories mm -hmm. also produce loose grains, so they would be assigned sea factory carbonates, even though they've formed under tropical water temperatures. Um, temperature does not always have to be the decisive factor, but I'm sure we agree on that one anyway. Yeah, Mauritania, I, I also uh, pointed it out on the map, right? That, that, that's one of these, these environments in which carbonates adopt to the, uh, to the environment. Of course, you have a lot of nutrients in there and therefore you, you will produce a different type of, of, of C factory or you, you will, of the T factory because you, you produce have so, many, so much food in the, in the uh, nutrients in, in, in the water column that you kind of switch. So only the latitude is not, not uh, what you should be looking at. It, it, it's assembly of, of parameters. It's, it's the nutrients, it's the temperature, it's, it's the light, it's, it's the latitude. Look at all the parameters and then the biota will decide where they will, will decide what, what will grow, right? They, they will adopt to, 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 the, uh, to the environment. And that's why I, I factories allows you to, to switch, right? I can have, have, have uh, sea factories in the middle of the tropics, depending on uh, how the situation is. That's why I, I, I agree with her that, that you can have sea factories in the, in the tropics, but it's because other factors kind of steer the biota into, the, into that direction. Okay. Um, our next question is from Saikat Misra, who wants to know, um, in a in a brief form, let's say, what controls the different mineralogy in the different factories? The mineralogy, of course, the uh, the normal, uh, I should say, chemistry of the water column temperature, and the carbonate saturation. Aragonite uh, in the tropics, actually, you shouldn't be forming it, but but because there's such a high carbonate saturation, that's why it's being formed. But it's also very unstable, like high magnesium calcite. Aragonite, it's very, for corals, for instance, it, they, for them, it's it energetically seen from an energy point of view. For them, it's, it's very good to uh, produce aragonite because they use less energy. That's why they do it. And they have a lot of carbonate calcium is available in, in the water column. That's why they do it. When I go to uh, colder waters, I still produce uh, aragonite, but you won't find it in the, in the sediment because it's being dissolved in the water column because the water are un undersaturated because of carbonate. And that's why these are actually two main factors that steer why aragonite and, and, and LMC carbonates uh, vary at, at different, uh, within different factories at different positions. Absolutely, that was um, a, good brief, a good brief answer for mineralogy. I know probably most of us can go on, on and on about it. So um, uh, yeah. yeah, if anybody has any other questions, please type them into the chat um, and we can get those. Uh, read out to John. In the meantime, John, I was sort of wondering if you have um, just a feel, a personal feeling for um, how much using these five categories can reduce the amount of error in sort of the models that we create in terms of carbonate stratigraphy. Like just yeah. moving from the three that were previous used to the yeah. five, like how much of a difference is, is this yeah. making? Okay, we, we could go back uh, to, you can put the cool, cool water corals in the, into the cool water if you really want to, because, but I try to split them because they, they occupy a different realm sure. and they produce a different, different morphology. That's why I, I, I did split them. I think when you start analyzing carbonates in outcrop or, or a core, look at the sediments first, and then you, you can understand what type of factory you're dealing with and what type of sequences you can develop. So, it should be the other way around. Look at your grains first, look at the biota first, right? Look at the, and then you will understand the system. Mm -hmm. That's that's the way I do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then of those of the five categories that we've been talking about today, um, which one just in terms of sequence stratigraphy do you think has uh, 
sort of the overall highest variability. So not only the deposition, but also maybe including some of those um, like diagenetic factors that might play a role. Yeah, but when you look at the, uh, the, I've been talking about morphology all the time, right? But morphology also includes digenesis. Otherwise you can't make a, a topography. Sure. So that's one very big thing in carbonates. When you then look at the cool water factories, they don't make a topography, they are loose sediments. So th that's why digenesis and carbonates go hand in hand with me. That's why certain sequences only can develop in certain areas when you look at the carbonate factory. Does it answer your question? Um, yeah, kind of. I mean, I can maybe restate it a little bit. I was just um, trying to get out of the five, um, the yeah. five different carbonate mm -hmm. factories, which one maybe has the highest variability or which one is would be the most difficult to um, create um, a legitimate model for, let's say. I think you have to create five different models. <laughs> yeah. The P factory you, you might leave out, but all the other ones you have to create different type, different models. But when you look at seismic profiles from, from M factories, like in Kazakhstan, or you compare that with tropical uh, platforms or, or the, the new Cretaceous ones they found in the Mediterranean, you have to develop your own sequence strat model for each carbonate factory, depending on the variables that, that, are, uh, that come with the system. Definitely. Okay, um, if there are no any, no other question. Oh, one more question popped up. Perfect. Um, so this is from Patrick Hansel in Erlangen, in Germany. Um, one question, um, is dolomitization possible in every carbonate factory? Yeah, it's, it's possible everywhere. Where you look at the present day uh, Arabian Persian Gulf, your dolomites formed on the spot. But also when you, uh, when you start burying carbonates and you, you start circulating fluids, dolomitization can take place. And, and, and dolomitization, okay, it will go for the aragonite and the high calcite first, because these are things you can dissolve easily, but at the end, it also can attack calcites. It won't stop. Dolomitization, it, it depends on burial and the amount of fluid circulation that you have in order to, uh, to occur. Okay. okay, next question from Unai from Spain. Um, hi, great talk, John. You've talked about the carbonate production during high stands and low stand systems. Yeah. What about um, falling systems tracks and um, so FSST and TST settings? Is there, sorry, there's a lot of questions popping up. Is there any kind of typical TST and FSST deposition for different, um, the five different carbonate factories? Yeah. When you look at the, uh, the high stand and low stand are, are in most systems, they're, they're pretty clear, but the falling stage systems tract is, is, of course, when you go to a tropical uh, carbonate factory, as soon as you uh, pass the edge of the platform and you go, be, you expose the, uh, the shallow water carbonate uh, factory, you stop the system. You get a, a little bit of resedimentation and some sediment production on the slopes, but that's it. When you go to an M factory, falling stage systems tract will perhaps diminish the carbonate production a bit, but it's still is able to produce sediment, so it doesn't stop. The cool water factory, the falling stage system strike, they behave like normal sands. You would clean up the shallow water area if there are shallow water, if there are grains left, and they will be pushed to the uh, to the uh, to the shelf edge. There, there are some nice studies by an ODP lag that was drilled on the on the uh, Australia studies of, of Saxena and Betzer on that, or, or Noel James. That really highlighted this, this type of behavior during the fall stage systems tracts. Transgressive systems tracts, uh, when I go to the M factory, it depends on if you, you may have a little bit of variation because you start up the system a little bit more, get a different type of water circulation, but it won't affect the, the global uh, production of sediments. The same for cool water, you flood the area again, so you might have a little bit shift of uh, sediment loci. Like I said, look at this Saxena and, uh, and Betzler uh, publication. They really showed they had different types of, of, of shelf edge deposits depending on high stands or low stands. And also during transgression, you start restart the system. Transgression system tracking in, in tropical carbonates, it depends when you start flooding the shallow water area, once again, of your flat top platform and the zone hits the, yeah. Zone that, that can be uh, illuminated by, by the light or is in the light saturated zone, 
can start producing sediments again. So it really depends on, on the morphology of the system, the type of, of sediment or the type of factor you're dealing with. So FST and TST also depends on the, on the system. In tropical systems, FST and the TST are, are not important. In M factory, it doesn't matter when you go to uh, C factories, they behave like uh, plastics. Okay. Um, our last question is from Stephen from Derby in the UK. Right. Terrific presentation, John. Sorry if I missed this, but have you mapped the abundance distribution or relative um, dominance of the five types over time? We uh, what, what, what we have done, yeah, we, we've done that. It, it will uh, show up in the uh, in the Reddick book, the fourth uh, edition. There, there are variations over time. Uh, we also, there was a postdoc, uh, Alex Arabian, he had a look at uh, different types of sediment export and then compare it to, uh, to carbonate factories. Uh, th that's one thing that's still in progress, but there are variations depending on uh, age and the type of factory. There are variations over time. Okay, so um, everybody keep an eye out for those, uh, those figures in the new book. Yeah. Um, okay. So with that, we will thank you so much again, John, for the wonderful presentation. Right. Thank you. And um, everybody for joining us for this week's webinar. Don't forget to come back next week for the fourth SEDS Online student webinar. Um, that's going to be looking at exploring sediment transport dynamics from source to sink. Um, not source and sink, but source to sink, I guess. So we'll be talking about plastics, hopefully. Um, so please come out and support the students. And um, yeah, so anybody else that's celebrating Thanksgiving coming up tomorrow, um, enjoy your holiday. We All look right. forward to seeing you next week. Enjoy, bye-bye.